everyone and welcome to our Panic Together sessions here at the Tetley in partnership with the Art House. Um, we're really delighted for you to join us today as we kick off our second and final weekend of artist development sessions, training, talks, etc. Um, so this session is called Decarbonising Your Creative Practice and we're delighted to invite Sean Ward Parker here with us who is an artist, environmental educator and fermentation enthusiast based at Dart Artist Community in rural Derbyshire. His work examines the life cycle of materials, complexities of civil responsibility, civic responsibility and problem solving through collaborative action. His practices his, he practices the traditional approaches to craft and art making using leftover or abundant items of nature and artifice to explore feelings of eco-anxiety in late stage capitalism and redistributes resources through flexible care structures like labour exchanges and favours. So yeah, um, just to describe myself really quickly, I'm Georgia, I'm the Exhibitions and Artist Development Curator here. Um, I'm a white British Hispanic woman with pale skin and dark hair, and I just want to hand over to Sean. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, I'm Sean Roy. I am dressed like a leaf today because it's spring. Um, white English male with curly hair. Um, thanks to um, Bella and Georgia for inviting me um, to be part of this program. And um, I'm not going to show any slides today, but I just want to uh, do a talk based on some of the work that I've been thinking about recently. Um, and really, it's a sort of a personal, ongoing practice of interrogation and uh, into, my, my, into my consumer habits and a sort of reorganizing of, of my. Of the priorities in my life uh, to allow me to um, continue this kind of journey of self-education and, uh, and weaning myself off of carbon. Um, so uh, yeah, really uh, my practice at the moment and this talk in general is going to be uh, very um, self-explanatory but uh, based on things that are prevalent in, in my own artistic practice rather than a, a set of rigid rules that everyone should be adhering to. I think it's um, a difficult subject to approach and one that I've um, continuing to um, find very challenging but also very fruitful in this investigation. Um, and also obviously it's got to be, I just want to make it clear that not everything that I'm saying is going to be at, at applicable for everyone um, and so I just uh, yeah I want to move through with positivity um, and hopefully yeah can uh, instigate some interesting conversation at the end so I'll just do like a half an hour uh, presentation um, then I want to show a, a film like a video essay and then we can have maybe some questions at the end if that if that works um, and just to elaborate a little bit on my personal journey, uh, kind of um, after my BA, I kind of began, began to um, work towards self-educating and have done a, a lot of uh, self-organizing and DIY projects, very much positioning myself outside of institutions. Um, and 
I've moved from recently I've moved from out of London to Dart. So I've kind of removed my physical self from the city and plonked myself in a kind of rural arts community, which has been extremely interesting. And um, I've just come into a lot of time and space, which I never, I never had before. Um, I have also, I'm trying to transition from a kind of fast and dislocated practice um, towards a more slow embodied practice and uh, thinking about ways that I can um, reduce my own dependence on um, in the institutional art world as a sort of, sort of as a need for validation but also the kind of all that all the energy and all the uh, fossil fuels and obfuscated labor and um, material extractions that go towards kind of upholding the arts industry in general. Um, and I think maybe most apparent from my um, my visual work uh, is that I have kind of spent a long time developing new language around waste and developing new language around uh, surplus and abundant materials. So taking what was quite a um uh you know it was a financial necessity uh not uh, not being able to buy new art materials and actually uh, you know engendering or like embodying this kind of resourcefulness and turning it into the way that i actually make art the way that i try and live in a in a more um environmentally responsible way um, and I think that although some of the topics are like kind of uncomfortable, um, it's just uh, necessary to really try to be actively anti-capitalist in the way that I think and move um, and um, in, a, in a time where we seem like we've got less space than ever to move in, I think uh, ultimately trying to take some responsibility for small aspects of our lives that we can um, change. Um, being artists and being creative people, we're definitely uh, taste makers. We're definitely people who um, are kind of at the vanguard of culture. And there's a, I think there's a really interesting potential that we can start shifting without waiting for permission. Um, from uh, these these institutions or these these sort of uh, cultural gatekeepers, um, and so just in plain terms, decarbonisation is the transition away from high energy, labour intensive um, processes of extraction, which rely heavily on fossil fuels, um, but in a more abstract way related to my own practice it's also this ongoing journey of self-determination um self-education and self-expression um and very much uh, embedded in a sort of collaborative um like joyful practice moving through the difficult stages of uh late stage capitalism and towards something that's more like joyful and abundant um, and I think that the word panic is really interesting because it makes me think about um, making irrational decisions under duress, under stress, and potentially we can use this opportunity of making irrational decisions as a way of uh, holding on to and taking ownership of anti-capitalist ideas, uh, pushing against the norms that we've kind of been boxed into and trying to break new ground. <laughs> so um the heavy stuff first but we'll, we'll move we'll move through it um so through global colonization of in, indigenous peoples and also the domestic land theft of peasants uh in the industrial revolution um humans have become increasingly uh dislocated um from nature from the land so when humans have been forced off or bought out, uh, the land then has been chopped up uh, and sort of transformed into a resource that can be bought or sold. And we've got to a point in this kind of abstracted form of capitalism, um, which relies on infinite extraction, um, that we, we've kind of 
turned nature into an image. We've kind of split it uh, completely from reality and it's just kind of a flat image that we, we are able to project our desires onto um, and also kind of um, dominate. And I think that's really key because one industry that's celebrated for human domination over nature is the art industry. Um, especially over the natural environment and also over um, other life forms, uh, animals and plants. Uh, so it's, I would say maybe as a, gen a general understanding, it's pretty taboo to criticize the art world and each institutions from um, ecological perspective. Um, and it's quite easy to play it down in comparison to other industries. Um, but as someone who's um, always been interested in, in art, um, one, of, maybe, uh, one of my main questions is why are we obsessed with um, using some of the most toxic materials known to man uh, in order to create and mimic um, our objects that look organic. And I, I, the reason that I've chose not to show um, slides today is because I don't want to highlight any particular examples of good and bad. Uh, I don't want to like call anyone out. And I also don't want to like praise anyone in particular because for me, the, the journey is um, maybe more of like a philosophical change rather than a material change because ultimately if we reduce everything to um, just the materials that we consume then uh, it's likely that we will already or have already been um, co-opted by kind of green capitalism where we very much have uh, we can be sold anything because there's a comparison that this is better than this or this is worse than this um, and actually there's maybe a more of a um, deeper reconciliation with our habits that I'm maybe trying to get through in my own practice. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, the, for me, the ecological violence of art is in the mass produced low cost materials and the dangerous processes that it takes to extract them from the earth. Um, the unsafe underpaid labor of um, workers from source to shop and also the fossil fuels that are used to harvest, transport and um, uh, pack, you know, wrap, protect um, artworks. And um, yeah, as consumers, I feel like we are forced to be complicit in these systems that uphold structural inequalities. Uh, particularly thinking about gender, um, race and class capitalism, because there's a, there's a constant threat that our basic needs are not going to be met. And so we are kind of held captive in this abusive relationship with scarcity. Um, we've been socialised into this world as consumers primarily. And so I think that it's only, uh, it's only obvious that we would look at everything through this consumer lens, whether it's our education, which is something that, you know, um, these like oversimplified transactions that kind of, uh, that dominate our everyday. So whether it's yeah, education or our relationship to food or even like leisure, the idea of like work and not work and this, uh, everything comes back to, um, to the kind of uh, control over labor in some ways. And so when we come back to art social function, um, beyond playing into uh, a rigged um, market, um, we, we only really get to see a glimmer of art. Um, it's almost as if uh, this, these sculptures or these photographs or these paintings are um, like an apple on a shelf in a supermarket. We only see it for a very brief period of its life um, when it's kind of a finished kind of purchase, purchasable, consumable um, item or 
commodity. And actually for me, um, a lot of the, the uh, joy and difficulty in my practices is, is through trying to expand on some of these life cycles and trying to um, explore what happens before and during and after. And so these are maybe ways that weighs into thinking about how we can um, make more responsible decisions and also how we can maybe point out some of the hypocrisies within art making that um, are related to um, yeah, the, the language around sustainability, for example, which is a quite a pernicious term I'm not, not very keen on. Um, and yeah, like all these, all these, all this labor, all this uh, material extraction, all this fuel leading up to kind of one moment, um, the moment of the kind of opening of the gallery, the opening of the exhibition. Um, and then, you know, obviously the, the, the work has this afterlife, but we don't get to really see that either. It either goes back to someone's studio or it's, you know, in a storage or it gets put in the bin. And I think these all need to be really thought about in the terms of the entire, the entirety of the life, the lifespan of, of art materials. Um, and I, I, I think that this, uh, um, the space between uh, uh, art and the viewer kind of maintains the distance from the labor, the materials and the fuel. Um, it, it's a form of alienation that we've become very comfortable with um, in consumer capitalism. We're very much removed from uh, nature. And to me, it's, uh, it's an open goal to pull back the curtain and, and sort of have, uh, investigate the narratives. Um, particularly as an opportunity to consider the environmental impact of our personal practices without judgment and without the need for permission. So, um, you know, personally, I kind of got sick of waiting for um, governmental or, you know, um, wider social change. And so I very much feel like through reorganizing my own life, um, I'm trying to take uh, more responsibility for my actions and kind of cr create work that is um, not only f fulfilling in a um, in an emotional way, but also uh, as a as a way of like pushing pushing through towards how I maybe see things panning out once we've uh, sorted out this mess. Um, and yeah, it's been like a. Uh, as much as a, a material upheaval, it's been very much like a, a philosophical upheaval, um, spending, trying to turn inwards more, trying to spend more time um, being like honest and uh, asking myself difficult questions in a bit to kind of shift my understanding of my own place in the world. <laughs> so I have some like, questions to you know like I said I, I don't really I don't really have solid answers I don't, I'm not really telling anyone how to make changes within their own lives but I just have some some questions um, that might um, that I can hopefully enlighten on so how do we become unalienated or integrated uh, unalienated from or integrated with uh, the organic world through maybe active repair um, and also uh, our relationships with the non-human. How can we move on in solidarity with human and non-human bodies um, who we are often forced to trample over in order to uh, achieve our desires? And um, how can we escape the reliance on carbon heavy industries um, while uh, finding uh, finding meaning and purpose with ourselves and with our peers. So I'm just going to let those digest and have a little sip of water.
So before we start anything at all, before we make any changes, we have to understand that it's not going to be an overnight shift and these things take many, many years, um, particularly as people who've been socialized in a, a, um, a very um, rigid way, let's say. And so it's really important that we approach anything to do with uh, these, this transformation with uh, no judgment and um, no shame. It's not our individual faults that we live like this, um, no matter how many, what advertisers tell you or what the government tells you, this is, these issues are very systemic. Um, it's a series of purposeful decisions, um, the construction of barriers to meeting our, our needs. Uh, and so I, I, I feel like we have to exercise compassion through the snow, through uh, slowness, noticing, looking, um, these both practices are, are um, generally seen as passive, but I actually see them as quite active practices. Uh, basically, um, resisting the uh, desire to like place expectations on things and to create comparisons between things because these very much embody the nature of being a consumer. Um, a is better than B, B is worse than C. Um, if we can suspend these and, and spend more time noticing and, and looking without judgment, it's, um, we can try to decentralize our human experience and become um, aware and um, uh, touched by the, in, the interspecies intimacy of the everyday. Um, there's a, within permaculture, there's a, a uh, one of the elements of looking is to do with the circle of influence and it, that basically means like what can the it's it's easier to concentrate on it, the, the things that you do have control over rather than everything outside of that which is pretty much everything that you don't have control over and this was like quite a large thing for me to get over being someone who um has or had has uh, eco anxiety from quite a long time and just trying to deal with this through making art, um, you know, trying to deal with this kind of environmental depression. Um, it's very much wanting to change the whole world and feeling very overwhelmed and hopeless and, and helpless. And coming to a point where I was able to reconcile that I didn't have much control over these things that were beyond me and that actually the real work was um, maybe turning inwards and, and working on um, myself first and um, yeah making like small 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 changes and understanding that uh, you know this way that we consume is a is the habit of a lifetime it's not something that we can just kind of switch off it's very much embedded into every decision that we make and the way that we look at everything um, and I think that there if we have the access to information and we have the means to um, make changes but we choose not to then I, um, I do wonder if there's an element of climate denial as well if we if we have if we understand what's happening and we very much um, are in a position to, to make those shifts but we we, we don't want to um, um, inconvenience ourselves and I do I, I do feel like that's maybe a, it's a contentious but there's so I think there's some um, issues with climate denial and that we have to actually if we, if we can take responsibility and we can have agency over things that we do and the way that we think then there's uh, you know something something to push on with um, and I kind of want to uh, think about art projects as well as like moving from vanity projects to sanity projects. Like how can we use this kind of ecologically charged practice or projects to um, 
really deal with the, the sort of pain and violence of living in this, um, this kind of messy, messy um, late capitalist world uh, and how we, how we can use them to survive and thrive. So moving through from sort of scarcity, which is very much an economic political choice towards this like abundance mindset of understanding how much there already is here and that we don't need anything we potentially don't need anything else. Um, yeah. um, one huge aspect of decarbonizing or, you know, uh, allay, um, reducing the need for energy intensive uh, materials is to do less. And I know it seems like maybe quite counterproductive to people who've been um, socialized with that kind of uh, hyper busy minds, but the pressure to always make more and the pressure to always make new um, in this kind of insatiable attention economy it, um, is very much like a capitalist trap. Um, I think we can, lean towards uh, the idea of divorcing ourselves from the kind of sort of consumer self and um, resisting uh, the social norms of productivity. And I think like all of these, you know, are very much related to work and um, the kind of hobby to jobby pipeline, the kind of uh, over professionalization of things that you're interested in is a, is a huge, um, yeah, but it's like very, it's quite problematic in a lot of ways, not only because you, it's very easy to lose sight of and lose the love for the things that you do. If you're, um, if you've been convinced that you need to um, uh, commodify them. And so as artists, I think that we have, we can find joy and inspiration in going the long way around and also sometimes not going there at all. Um, do we need to make everything that we think about? Is it important? Who are we trying to prove a point to? Um, you know, uh, sometimes an artwork is enough just to think about it. <laughs> I don't know. There's this image, I can't remember the artist, but there's this image of like, um, I think it's like a Cadillac uh, buried in the desert. And it's just like the thought of that is like enough. Like you don't actually need to do the physical artwork. I think like that's quite a beautiful poetic image in itself. And so like this dematerialization of my personal practice is something that I'm going through at the moment, very much thinking about, well, is it necessary to make objects? If I call myself an artist, like, do I not become, do I, and become an artist if I want to stop making objects. And uh, I'll come on to this a little bit more later. Um, and there's an opportunity to start again, you know, um, the best time to make a change was yesterday and maybe the, the second best time is today. <clears throat> if we're able to um, approach our own work with honesty and acceptance, then we might be able to start deconstructing um, some of the projects that we've already done, looking back um, into, into significant parts and, um, you know, kind of going back to what I said earlier about with no shame, it's very important to kind of accept what we've done and just um, appreciate that it's, it's just in our own story. Um, you know, the materials, the labour, the transport, the presentation, all of these things in any project that we've ever done um, will be quite easy to deconstruct. And I think it's an interesting um, uh, practice or interesting um, way of, of really coming up against some of the more difficult elements of, of, of making. Um, like identifying difficult feelings and also potential areas of stickiness um, while we're trying to avoid comparing ourselves, whether it's comparing our, us as a person or the work that we make, um, because it's very easy to find extreme examples of the opposite. 
And I think this is very much a way that we um, can create a uh, hy hyperbolic identity is around like saying, well, I'm not as bad as this, or I'm not as good as that. And you draw really extreme comparisons and it, it very, it's quite skewy. Um, <clears throat> so we can apply our critical rigor as well, like through what we've been learning or reading or using pre-existing um, um, methodologies. We can ask ourselves really, really honest, difficult questions about some of the choices that we made. Were they uh, aesthetic preferences? Did we have kind of time constraints, financial constraints? Um, are there any hypocrisies in our work? And is there a sensitivity to the materials and labor? Um, and I think that it's very easy to make work about the environment. It's very easy to um, think about the flat images of the environment, but is it as easy to make work that is in for with betwixt underneath comp decomposted by like nature like they're kind of different things and i think for me this is like the beginning of a sort of ethical framework with which i've used as a sort of processing tool for my everyday practice as a way of um putting things through um these kind of um yeah, there's this framework, asking myself questions and making considerations about um, as many aspects of, of the processes as I can. And I, I really, uh, I want happiness for myself and I want happiness for everyone else. And I think that we, if we're going to really um, transition away from these very sort of um, in violent embedded everyday processes then we have to think about whether our happiness is at the expense of others and that might be humans that might be plants that might be animals um, you know we can all live rich exciting fulfilling lives but um, are we also allowing others to do the same and you know that could be insects worms microbes fungi um, you know i think it's important to really um try and formulate uh, some soft software, some soft architecture for like respect for all life forms and to um, reject eco-fascist ideas of like uh, overpopulation, which is a, a really um, intense Western green capitalist idea. Um, you know, like I said, scarcity is, is an economic choice. There's, um, in terms of material wealth, like there's, there's far more than we need to go around. It's just a, it's just a case of um, it being redistributed unfairly. Um, so, yeah, we, we should, or well, should is not a good word. It would be preferable if we could, um, see ourselves not as individuals but as all parts of a sort of creative proletariat um i've been reading lots of mark fisher recently and he writes a lot about uh, well it's about these lectures that he did just before he, he um he passed in 2017 and it's about group consciousness and um yeah i think like connecting with each other through like class solidarity and understanding that most uh, important changes throughout history have been made by the working classes, have been made by the proletariat, and kind of uh, identifying ourselves with that, with that struggle, with that forever struggle, um, can be very empowering, um, and it also maybe knit, knits us together tighter um, in terms of the kind of uh, um, yeah work away from this kind of monolithic capitalism. Um, so, you know, it's important maybe to not try and build an alternative uh, to capitalism in its own image because we, uh, we want to kind of abolish this monolithic culture and embrace the kind of chaos and the, the ferality 
of, uh, of, of co-design, of collaboration, of relinquishing control and um, being open to uh, serendipity, failure, learning. Um, and really like tuning into this surplus and abundance of materials has been such a huge part of uh, changing the way that I see um, my own existence within uh, the world, but also the way that I process uh, materials and kind of continue my art practice. So, um, develop, like I said at the beginning, developing a visual language around um, waste, around surplus, um, and becoming fluent in debris. Um, I have choice paralysis, like I'm a, I'm a rubbish shopper because I can't make a decision. So I've rearranged my life so that I can just uh, um, intercept the flow of materials that go past me um, and make choices based, based on those. Um, so every block of wood, every plastic bag, um, every ripped garment is a potential art medium. Uh, I also <laughs> would love for us to think about uh, dissolving linear time and abolishing the clock because uh, really everyday creativity is uh, at first harder and counterintuitive but actually becomes quite an interesting training ritual for sharpening our tools for understanding um, and the, the organic life cycles of um, non-human uh, species is really has become really important for me in determining um, my work within the seasons so like making thinking and resting are all equally important and um, dropping out of this sort of race uh, and um, seeing my work some of my work is like time bending especially with fermentation it's this very visual distortion of time which I just find super super fascinating so that makes me think about it, it permanence and impermanence like, is it important that work artworks live forever or is it more important within my work like can my art be um you know eaten composted digested and then finally i just think that entertaining alternative currencies is a really um, important way of uh, decentralizing and, and um, shifting away from the kind of uh, um, our very narrow understanding of value. So we can swap, we can do favors, we can share, we can do labor exchanges, we can give without expecting back. Um, building trust beyond the sterling um, is kind of goes some way to, towards uh, decoupling the value from capital. Um, and this noticing, this like beautiful everyday practice of noticing, actively looking, um, has very much given me a, a, a new impetus to kind of um, be open to receiving gifts from the, from the everyday as well. So, yeah, I did rattle through that. There's quite a lot. I think about this on a re really long, regular basis, and it's, it's very much like a something that is so prevalent in my practice so it's quite hard to squish it all in one but what i'm going to do now is we'll i'll show a video essay um, from 2020 and hopefully it will give you a little bit more um yeah all right thank you sean that was absolutely brilliant uh, we're just going to pause this um session now and my colleague will put on the work for you online and then we'll show it in the room at the same time then we'll regroup for questions so please um, get back with some questions too. Thanks and enjoy. Oftentimes, living in a city as densely populated and highly urbanised as London, it's impossible to feel in ownership of my body. Everywhere at every time of the day, I'm on private land that I have no stake in, in my rented flat, at one of my jobs or in my studio, buying groceries or law lunch, traveling through zones, meeting with friends in a park. My body 
is a caveat shuffling from property to property, some overtly not mine and others more covertly so. I've found that recently, whenever I'm overwhelmed with claustrophobia or mood spiraling, I take to endlessly cooking or fermenting or scavenging or sewing or cording as a body activation tactic. These methodologies require manual dexterity, but also allow for a sort of free association game for my eyes and brain. There are no exactitudes, no wrong answers, no failures, only moments of realization. While clearly a successful distraction, I begin to notice how these processes poke at and fray my understanding of my own artistic practice, revealing messy layers of thought and action encapsulated in stress balls. Practice with a C is now practice with an S. When I briefly lived by the coast, I became time rich and money poor, so took to roaming the coastline on foot for hours, obsessively identifying wildflowers. Firstly, I moved slowly as a separationist uh, endeavor, discovering and observing these beautiful and strange beings that belong to a different world. Then I moved with haste as a capitalist, researching and extracting their names, etymology and uses for my studio or kitchen. The perfect stride only came when I saw myself among them in and with and part of the landscape. We share air, water and food. We communicate by moving our bodies when we are happy or in shock. The slow apocalypse is happening, so slight and gray most don't notice. The political narrative in which climate crisis is imminent but preventable sus uh, suspends reality in the forever future. But this is now I have come to realize that my art practice and prepping have got a lot in common. I'm a friendly anarcho survivalist, slipping between the institution and the nothing, staying alive with my carrier bag of tools, skills and recipes, waving at people through windows. Edges are where things happen and cities are mostly edges. Overlapping, shifting boundaries, the action is always in, on, under, beside, beyond the place you might be thinking of. In a municipal park, mowing dictates the intersection between in and out of bounds. Since the perimeter of usage is clearly defined by different lengths of grass, we are faced with an invisible but omnipotent authority. When we are locked out of the parks, we contribute taxes towards maintaining. We should consider whether it's for our protection or the plants. I think a lot about the nature culture dichotomy drilled into the very foundations of our capitalist realism. The flattening of wild nature replaces biodiversity with universities. I wonder why as humans, we are educated from an early age to see ourselves separate from the land. In what ways are we primed to project our ideals of beauty onto the passive landscape? How does this indoctrination practically play out in our shared green spaces? I wrote this at the beginning of the year to try and crystallize my thoughts. If, brackets, when, there is a food shortage this year because of unseasonal weather, brackets, see climate crisis, COVID-19, brackets, see capitalism epidemic, and lack of land workers, brackets, see racist conservatives. We had better realize the fragility of a just-in-time global food system, which relies so heavily on the oppression of working classes to grow, transport, and sell it and understand the unique importance of learning how to find, harvest and preserve our own. The terms foraging, organic and farming have become classed and their meanings degraded to pure athlete. Wild food and the cultivated versions grown by skilled craftspeople are the root, leaf and flower of all cuisine, of all medicine and of all community. In part, my theory is a long, uh, sorry, in part, my theory is it's a long purposeful degradation of education 
which has made us vulnerable to a toxic dependency on supermarkets. Here, there is an unlimited offering of produce, all cartoonish, shiny, neatly stacked and wrapped in plastic. The commodification of fruit and vegetables has stripped them of their uniqueness, uh, stripped them of their unique beingness and difference and replace them with tokens of labor oppression and carbon intensive globalism. I consciously boycotted supermarkets almost a decade ago, not always convenient or affordable and at times impossible, but I have reconnected with food in a totally new way, investing my money in businesses that are transparent or local or regenerative prevents me from a total meltdown. Spending time finding wild food in the city is a tonic to loneliness and can diversify your diet. When you begin to move slower and look harder, everything is suddenly vivacious and herbaceous. The reduction of council spending in certain boroughs due to central austerity benefits our green spaces immeasurably. More undisturbed growth means greater chances for pioneer plants to settle, attracting pollinators, insects and mammals. To find edible species is over overcoming our plant blindness and aversion to dirt. We must learn to be non-judgmental observers. My relationship with the other than human is interdependent and intrinsic. I'm not, a, I'm not an economist, but I could tell you of 15 plants that taste better and cost less than spinach and they grow straight out of the ground. I'm not a dietitian, so I won't lecture you on the advantages of eating food that hasn't been flown in from another country in a refrigerated box. I'm not a herbalist, however, you should at least know all medicine came from wild plants. Strengthening our allyship with the undergrowth is one way to consider how to coexist. In order to learn anything about ourselves, we must realize we are kin with the ivy, the worker ants and the mycorrhizal network. We are biologically and culturally intertwined. In pre-Christian Middle Ages, followers of paganism illustrated their bodily entanglement with nature through personification of the seasons. The Jack in the Green, for example, is the spring equinox, spring equinox character, an embodiment of fertility and the symbol of prosperous regeneration and procreation. Whole communities would gather and still do wearing traditional costumes made entirely from new growth harvested from common land and to sing and dance for days on end. We are experiencing a revival of these celebrations, which both respect the secular origins and respond to contemporary global issues. If you have ever been emotionally stressed by whether a discarded drinks bottle will end up in a big pile or be incinerated or sent around the world on a boat or find itself in an animal's stomach, you might be an eco warrior this was my default mode of existence during the formative years of my environmental illness. It was the sort of depression that seeing a littered park would send me into a tailspin. It kept me rooted in bed for days. I fluctuated between hopelessness and numbness, outbursts of crying and bodily anxiety. I tried to ask myself why people would disrespect our shared spaces. Why didn't they care? And what could I do about it? I was internalizing the catastrophe, taking personal responsibility for capitalism and how it entrenches civilians into struct. Sorry. <clears throat> and how it entrenches civilians in destructive behaviors. I realize now how passive that version of me was, waiting for people to find a reason to change, waiting for, for a government to act in our interests and those of our non-human friends, waiting, waiting. I now have accepted the only way to stay alive in myself 
is to embrace the chaos, practice gratitude, and be authentic to myself. Those insecurities and afflictions now charge my work with a new purpose, to appreciate and highlight the abundance of material resources that are overlooked and underused, to ascribe alternative value systems that decouple us from capital and build community. The micro becomes the macro, zooming out of cells and fractals to reveal cultural patterns, epochs and landscapes. The entirety of civilization in a Petri dish. Each activity is a collaboration with something other than human. Heat, bacteria, threads, debris, most things wouldn't happen without all the players. A few happen perfectly fine without intervention. I'm not a participant. I'm a co-conspirator. We work together in slow ways, in a mirror or a chase or a dance. I know that I am dispensable. The point is that I should be able to dispense myself as I please. Fermentation, simply put, is the creation of an environment that is hospitable for benevolent bacteria, but not pathogens, who then share, digest, consume, and transform the available resources into a self-perpetuating system of material transcendence. Fermentation builds community between the microorganisms that digest and secrete unique flavoroids and between the humans that traditionally practice this ancient preservation technique. Cool. Um, Sean, thank you so much for that contribution to that film as well. Um, and thanks to all of you who came to join us online. Um, I'd like to now switch to some questions. Um, to be honest, I don't think anyone or I can even sum up that intersectional expanding talk that was beyond a talk, but also sharing in exercises of possibilities and ways of being in the world. So thank you ever so much. Um, so now let's flip to the questions. Has anyone in the room got any questions for Sean? Sophie. So I need to be careful about ignorance, but um, well, George said about first, and I'm being a sister now how that comes into your practice. So we've got exercises in pickling, just for people who might not have heard that online, how that came into your practice. Um, yeah, I, uh, I was living in Hastings in uh, 2016. And I um, went to a workshop, pickling workshop, and uh, from the very moment I entered that room, I was hooked. The, um, the teacher was a, a local illustrator, not a pro, just some guy that was making sauerkraut in his kitchen at home. And the, uh, the way that he um, held the workshop and um, kind of allowed this like very chaotic, smelly, uh, collaborative practice to unfold really like really, yeah, totally took me by surprise and, and I just became like really obsessed with it. And, you know, um, definitely was, uh, something that I've practiced. It's become part of my everyday, like the way that I've been on this sort of food de decommodification journey, like, understanding my relationship with what I eat and where I get it from and um, you know, connecting with like um, peasant ancestors, you know, like how they preserved food in terms of, uh, you know, with the seasons. Um, and so fermentation for me has also become 
this like metaphor for uh, collaborating with the other than human. So considering my relationship with bacteria and um, seeing them as like uh, act, like actively transforming or um, morphing uh, raw materials into something that's different. And then me as someone who's just maybe providing a container for that work, maybe not actually participating, maybe just um, creating the right environment for, a, for it to flourish. And there's also an element of um, bringing something that we maybe see as dead back to life. Even though plants and fruit and vegetables are always alive, the commodification of them means that we often see them just as objects, items. And so through for lacto fermentation, um, you know, you've got a, jar, a bubbling, smelly jar of something that has visibly and kind of sensorially become alive again. And I just think it's like totally fascinating. I do lots of workshops and have done lots of workshops over the last few years about it. Um, we've also got just a comment online from Georgia William who says, big up to you, Sean, and the way you think. Uh, your practice and thoughts have given further thoughts to my wonders, doubts and values. I'm very happy I attended today. So thanks. Thanks online. And yeah. Yes. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is like very, uh, and, and from like a working class background, and like a lot of people from very kind of socioeconomically deprived backgrounds, and you also don't you know, access art, a lot outside education, and also you don't know, access a lot of education. And also a lot of people don't have a lot of time, it's going to get away from a lot of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So I think a lot of the things you're talking about, I really agree with them, but it's like a whole system change. Oops. And I wondered how you could see, and I think it can, not me personally, but it can come across as quite privilege. Like I have this time to be outside and my small hole that needs tent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it's like, I just wondered how you see the things that you've been talking about could be transferred into working in that kind of environment where I'm trying to get people to like maybe engage in something creative like for the first time on a really small budget without access to loads of things. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And so it's like, yeah, I, everything you're saying, I'm like, wow, this is so interesting, but I just, it's that, it's often why I think then work becomes really like parents' the environment is because it doesn't have all the things that can be a bit luxurious. Yeah, 100%. And I, you know, like I said at the beginning of the talk, it's, it can be really alienating and difficult to, to confront these accepted norms. You know, the, the privileges that I have, apart from like being white and male, are more of a time privilege. But that is through a, a really long term disengagement from con consumption, mm -hmm. like a really long term ongoing. Um, shift of my priorities and my relationship so it's quite a hard thing to get across and I do appreciate that it, it also does you know it does come across like oh I've got it so good but like oh, yeah, I yeah. had it no no how I get like a full monocap for three jobs yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, for sure well you, like, I mean where her food comes from yeah <laughs> really difficult questions um, you know I really think that yeah that's something that's a really important thing that you said about like the really difficult questions and you know I really think that part of um the, the sort of activism that we need to do as middle class people or like you know sort of socially mobile people mm. is to advocate for UBI mm. um, you know to actually uh, you know to put to put pressure on um, uh, and to advocate for uh, universal universal basic income which you know will relieve a lot of not only um, time poverty but also food poverty and scarcity. Um, so I don't really, I feel like any sort of like anything that's like intrinsically like cr creative to like fill a social role is also this, uh, um, it's part of like big society, like David Cameron, big society, like actually, um, defunding, um, social welfare and like defunding social work and like putting it on artists to like sort of provide that entertainment and actually it's like a lot more serious than just being entertaining for an hour so I think there's an element of like resourcefulness that I really engender in my own practice and like I said that's come from a very 
uh, for, it was a financial requirement for me to, if I was going to make art, like I don't have money to buy canvases, I don't have money to, you know, buy materials. I like, I just uh, became a scavenger, mm. and actually, like the scavenging and the transformation, the fixing, actually then became the practice. So moving from an outcome-based practice to a process-led practice. And so within that, you can also, um, I think it's more about like shifting expectations of what art is and what it does, rather than trying to provide uh, a very like neat packaged um, illustration of, of, of art, you know? Um, so for me, it's very much like these very sl slow, um, yeah, like something like tact, you know, something like tactile could be like um, using free materials to create like rope. You know, you can do it from like nettles, or you can do it from like plastic bags. You can just like learn like tying stuff and getting used to using your hands, getting used to looking at things without um, judgment as well. I've got a, a non-judgmental observation practice that I have done with loads of young kids and also with loads of old people and it's kind of like writing this like survival this like survival diary um, through spending time outside i guess it feels like it's like i feel like the people that need to be empowered like to make those changes it's like doing that little bit of you know doing our creativity to expose you to a world where you can like make informed and empowered choices and then eventually those people will be part of the people campaign of those massive changes it's, like, it's, yeah. it's it's also just like um trying not to get like co-opted by uh <laughs> like um the kind of art the art world like this kind of gatekeeping of what is and what isn't artistic practice and um you know like very much like I would say I define myself quite a lot by resisting that and kind of working outside of it. So, um, you know, it becomes then a sort of a expectation management, you know, like being it, like, I call myself an artist because it's purposefully vague, you know, it's purposefully vague. It's not specific because like every day I wake up and I want to do something different. I'm not, um, uh, cementing myself to one particular type of art practice is really important because I have a very short attention span. Thanks. Yeah, it we've got two more questions. So one question in the room. Um, what was that? Yeah, um, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Um, I sort of called it in that question a bit, but I just thought there's one of the roles I do is like working with students on an undergraduate program they have an awful lot of anxiety around the originality of their voice essentially which then comes from kind of social media cultures and things like this this idea that they have to say and that often is a massive barrier to them actually making <laughs> making movements towards developing their creative practice and the advice that i always try and give to open that is to just to play and to be more experimental and to try and learn through material engagements and not through not designing towards some kind of solution yeah. that has to be completely original or whatever um yeah and i just found it interesting something you said earlier about questioning every stage of a process and i sort of thought about how that intersects with you know those of those kind of young emerging artists or student artists Anxiety, so just wondering if you can sort of, what would be your advice for like people who are graduate artists or people who are non graduate artists who might have a balance between respect for the lifespan of materials but not for having the barrier to learning through planning? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, yeah, like I said, positioning myself outside of institutions mainly means it is quite hard to know exactly what the mechanics of t teaching undergraduates would be but I very much think about um, trying to yeah I've used the term already like relinquish control and this for me is like potentially a way of um, becoming less precious about the things that we make and so there are quite a few good exercises 
um, I mean, you can, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a writer called Kenneth Goldsmith who does a lot with um, people uh, writing things on their laptops and then passing their laptop on and then, um, you know, kind of having, uh, being, having your technology vulnerable to people that you trust. Uh, but then there's also more like material based, process led, um, which, you know, you can think about like screwing up, like, messing up your work, spending lots of time on something and then like turning it into something else or like giving it to someone else to it's just like changing your relationship with the materials and understanding that we don't have to be precious about everything that we make and actually like through giving it up and like the author the authoring you can actually open it to like quite interesting dynamic you know unexpected collaborations Thanks, Sean. Uh, we've got one last question online, then we're going to have to wrap up if that's okay. Sure, yeah. And that is, um, what do you think about the materials and energy used in digital artwork? So laptops, phones, cloud storage, and does dematerializing your practice mean less reliance on these devices? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, I don't want to get too much into the politics of technology because I think there's a, a line of... Uh, questioning around like uh if if um if we're anti-capitalist do we want to go back to times before capitalism which is obviously like a really silly uh, conservative um sort of argument and so you know we can have the objects of desire while sort of moving through um personally i'm much more of like an analog head anyway like i'm not very technically gifted um, and that's fine. I've kind of just lent into it a lot more, and um, I guess I'm more interested in um, learning, uh, yeah, kind of traditional craft skills, but using post-consumer materials. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone needs a laptop to like watch The Sopranos or whatever, so that's what I do. You know, it's all good. Thank you so much, Sean. That was right. incredible. Thanks, everyone at home as well. Um, we're going to have to finish it there because we've got another session within 10 minutes. So um, but thank you so much for coming and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow as well um, for the rest of the panel together. So bye. Thanks. <laughs>